Well, welcome everyone to our last event of the semester. Today's last day of class at UT, so it's, uh, uh, I guess, good for a lot of us to not work on grades and all that. Okay. Um, so, you know, today we're going to do something different. We're going to have a geophysicist. Is that right? That's how you refer to me, do we call? In the business school, talking about something, which is very unusual for us to host a geophysicist. And the reason for that is that every so often, the, the you know, I have to be thankful to the crazy leftists that do things that, you know, end up introducing me to, to, to Dorian. So if you don't know Dorian's story, Dorian, uh, a while back, I think, wrote something that basically called for universities to follow the principle of merit, fairness, and equality. Three words that I think we, most of us in this room, you'll be very, you know, uh, if you define those words as the English dictionary defines those words, uh, makes us uh, be supportive of those, those principles at university, no matter no matter how, what, what you should come in terms of your political persuasion. However, that put the door in some hot waters, and MIT decided to cancel a special invited lecture that they had for, for Dorian. He was supposed to give this important lecture on his physics work at MIT. And at that point, I think you got a lot of uh, notoriety, probably un not un un unusual notoriety. Indifferent. Indifferent. You're indifferent <laughs> to the notoriety. But anyway, but that's how I got to know Dorian, and, and I'm thankful for that in the spirit of, you know, kind of close to the holidays here. Um, so anyway, today's going to, Dorian has been since then, and maybe before that, uh, doing a lot of important work at the University of Chicago, uh, again, pushing for ideas related to merit, fairness, and equality in the principle, and, and abiding by the principles of the University of Chicago. He's going to talk to us a little bit about, about that today. Um, so thank you, Dorian, and thanks for joining us. And uh, anyway. So, I'm going to read an essay for you that I wrote. Uh, it's about the Chicago Principles, the Calvin Report, and the Shills Report. So, the Chicago Principles, the basic overview is everybody should be able to say whatever they want on campus. It doesn't matter if anyone gets offended. The Calvin Report says that, the, that a university uh, or any unit of it can't make an official statement on social and political issues. And the reason for that is to protect the individual faculty and students. And the Shills Report says that when hiring and promoting faculty, only academic considerations, in particular research and teaching, can be taken into account. So that's the basic overview. I'm going to uh, have a little essay here that, that talks about those, but instead of just sticking in sort of dry discussion of them, I've written some stories based on my experiences, things that I've seen, that will sort of uh, make it a little more interesting, hopefully. Before we start, can I ask a question? Yeah. Do you know the motivation? And the reasons why those reports were put in place and when. Yeah, so the uh, the Calvin report was first, 1967, and all of these reports reflect the long term uh, vision of the university expressed by a variety of presidents going back to the first president uh, in the late 19th century and repeatedly re expressed. But they felt in 1967 that they had to write a report saying that the university is not going to take positions on social and political issues because there was a lot of uh, pressure based on the uh, Vietnam War. In 1972, the main concern that motivated the Shills report was actually uh, uh, political appointees of faculty and uh, nepotism. And then the Chicago Principles is 2014. And I think. It pretty, should be obvious to everyone why they felt the need to reassert uh, absolute freedom of expression on campus. And so this is probably only going to take 20 minutes or so, and then I hope we can have more discussion uh, with everybody about the stories and how to interpret these ideas. Okay, science is a creative endeavor that requires the free and open exchange of ideas to thrive. So I focused a little bit on science because I'm a scientist. Society has benefited immensely from scientific progress, and in order for science to continue to better the lives of individuals and nations, scientific work must be evaluated on the basis of scientific merit alone. Over the past decade, however, scientific departments and organizations have become increasingly politicized to the point that the development of science is now being significantly impeded. This time, the assault has originated from the radical left, but conservatives have done their fair share of meddling in science and are likely to meddle again in the future. Sorry, Richard. Keeping politics out of science is something that all people of goodwill, both Democrats and Republicans, should be able to agree on. Or so, once upon a, thought, once upon a time, one would have thought. How can we ensure political neutrality in science? 
I want to propose three critical principles for the protection of science from politics and to illustrate them with three playful, slightly naughty fables about what has been happening when they are violated. The three principles are, number one, all scientists need to be able to say and argue whatever they want, even if it offends someone else. Number two, universities and academic societies need to maintain strict neutrality on all social and political issues. And number three, hiring needs to be done on the basis of scientific merit alone. These principles have been lucidly outlined in three important documents at the University of Chicago, where I teach geophysical science. The Chicago Principles on Free Expression, which were issued by the university in 2014. The Calvin Report on the university's role in social and political action from 1967. And that report says that the role is not to participate in social and political action. The Schills Report on the Criteria for Academic Appointments from 1970. All of these reports assume, as the Calvin Report puts it, that the mission of the university is the discovery, improvement, and dissemination of knowledge. This sounds prosaic. But the definition is important to emphasize because some people are now challenging it. They argue that faculty members should be activists who promote certain political positions and agendas rather than pursue truth wherever it may lead. I should add that we are not perfect at the University of Chicago, and I sometimes fear that we honor these principles more in the breach than in the observance. And yet these principles are important goals for every scientific institution to at least aim for. So I started my journey in this environment simply by self-censoring. For five years, I stayed away from campus whenever it was possible and avoided department gatherings. At first, I thought the problem was a few bad apples in my department yelling at everyone who disagreed with them and accusing them of being various types of witches. Uh, however, I slowly learned that I was observing just a small part of a, natu a national movement in favor of censorship and suppression of alternative viewpoints. It is absolutely essential that we resist this movement and encourage students and faculty to speak freely about whatever they want on campus. We all lose when people self-censor. And now I'm gonna give you some data. So, unfortunately, students and faculty are now self-censoring at alarming rates, in part as a result of the high profile cancellations of academics who have been found guilty of wrong thing. The Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, who have now changed their name to the Foundation for Individual Rights, Expression. An expression. Fire has documented 471 attempts to get professors fired or punished for their speech over the past six years, the vast majority of which have resulted in official sanction. And so that either means, uh, you know, reduction in teaching loads, unpaid time off, or, or being fired. In a recent report for the Center for the Study of Partisanship and Ideology, Eric Kaufman estimates that three in 10,000 faculty members experience a cancellation attack each year. That corresponds to about one attack every three years at a large research institute with about a thousand faculty. And since these cancellations are so public and potentially harmful to the victim's career, a small number such as this can have an outsized impact on free expression. According to the same report, 70% of centrist and conservative faculty in American universities report a climate hostile to their beliefs and 91% of Trump voting faculty say that a Trump voter would not express his or her views on campus or are, are unsure. Similarly, after a major academic freedom incident in the fall of 2021 that involved me, MIT polled faculty at two faculty forums and found that 80% are worried given the current atmosphere in society that your voice or the voice of your colleagues are increasingly in jeopardy and 50% feel it on an everyday base basis, your voice or the voices of your colleagues are constrained at, M at MIT. So 50% say that at, on an everyday basis, they're self-censored. The problem extends to students as well. More than 80% of students self-censor on, on campus, according to a fi uh, FIRE survey last year. To get a, a sense of the magnitude of, self of the self-censorship problem at universities, contrast those numbers with the fact that According to a recent paper in Social Sciences Research Network, uh, only 13% of American respondents did not feel free to speak their mind in 1954 at the height of McCarthyism. So we're talking about 80% of students are self-censoring on campus now versus only 13% of Americans at the height of McCarthyism. The discovery and transmission of knowledge is severely hindered under these conditions. 
Another factor encouraging self-censorship among students and faculty is a growing administrative apparatus that often has goals other than the pursuit of knowledge. One mechanism is the imposition of language games, which can seem silly but have the effect of establishing an orthodox way of viewing the world, discouraging dissent and stifling creativity. This pernicious practice can extend to faculty syllabi and even teaching. Here's a personal example. I was asked by an administrator not to use the term black body radiation in my class on global warming. Apparently black body, or, or more accurately, black space body, is now exclusively a critical social justice term. I refused. Black body is the scientific name for a hypothetical object that perfectly absorbs and emits electromagnetic radiation. Black body radiation is the correct physics term for what I was teaching, and there's no way I'm going to stop using it. Luckily for me, just standing up was all that was necessary in this case, but not everyone has the privilege of being a tenured professor at the University of Chicago. It was my wife who inspired me to start making my views known publicly. Her reason is that she was born in Ukraine at the tail end of the Soviet Union. When I told her what was happening on campus, she said, if you speak out, will you have trouble? And I said, why? And she said, it sounds like what my mother told me about Soviet times and people who spoke out had serious trouble back then. That was enough to convince me, not in this country, not on my watch. My wife's mother was, is a teacher. And in the aftermath of communism, she brought home the old propaganda books from school about Lenin and his pals. For fond mem memories to teach her children about the old ways, no way. She brought those home to burn them so they could stay home in the wintertime. So Lenin's system failed so utterly that people had to burn the old propaganda just to stay warm. In no small part of this failure was due to the fact that they allowed science to become politicized. Okay, that's the intro, and now for the first story. Consider a situation at the awesome Institute of Technology, AIT. It involves two main characters. The first character is named Dr. Centris, a professor at AIT. Dr. Centrist has devoted the past 30 years of his life to developing his biomedical skills and is now at the top of his field. He is working on cancer research and is close to finding a cure. No one questions his ability in the lab, his scientific honesty, or his devotion to science and his students. Moreover, Dr. Centrist has advised people of both sexes, all races, all sexual orientations, all religions, and all nationalities and treated them all with respect. Dr. Centris is a political centrist, smack in the middle of the American mainstream in his viewpoints. Some of his views are on the left. For example, he supports broad access to education and health care, as well as protecting the environment for everyone. And some are on the right. These will end up be, being considered provocative, controversial, and causing quite a bit of trouble at AIT. The second character in the story is Mr. Wolk Kibe, an undergraduate. Mr. Woke entered AIT as a physics major, but physics wasn't a good fit. So he switched to anthropology, which leaves him them much more time for other interests such as Twitter. At some point, it becomes publicly known that in his personal life, Dr. Centris clings to his guns and Bible. Upon hearing this, Mr. Woke looks up in shock from his there MacBook Pro with the appropriate political decal stickles, stickers, <laughs> spits out a mouthful of his there venti soy chai latte and declares that this is highly problematic. According to Mr. Wolf, supporting gun rights is a, oh wait, did I count something? Oh yeah, he clings to guns and violence. According to Mr. Wolf, supporting gun rights is a dog whistle or coded language for white supremacist vigilantism and therefore, minoritized people at AIT cannot feel safe and will be irreparably harmed if Dr. Centris is allowed to continue his scientific research there. Moreover, Christianity is an exertion of power used by the cis hetero patriarchy to oppress gender and sexual minorities. The LGBTQIA 2S plus community at AIT will not tolerate this type of bigotry on campus, according to Mr. Wu, who has apparently appointed himself, themselves, spokes folks for the entire community. <laughs> but it gets worse. In a conversation at lunch about a recent Supreme Court case, Dr. Centris lets it slip that he is pro-life. Mr. Wu declares this a blatant war on women position that cannot be tolerated. AIT needs to be a safe space where no gender minority has to hear and thereby be harmed by a viewpoint which she disagrees with. Mr. Woke says inclusivity 
dictates that this sort of violent hate speech must be restricted, and he, they, takes to Twitter to demand a speech code and a code of conduct to ensure that the climate at AIT is made safe and inclusive for everyone by inhibiting and silencing anyone who disagrees with him, them, of course. But I've saved the worst for last. Eventually, it comes out that horror of horrors, Dr. Centrist is a deplorable who actually voted for Donald Trump. Mr. Woke scrambles into action. He, they, organize a letter, organizes a letter of denunciation of Dr. Centrist, demanding that he be fired in order to protect minoritized people on campus who have been threatened by Dr. Centrist's violent and aggressive racist hate vote. Mr. Woke has plenty of allies who sign, and he, they, threatens everyone else with a similar denunciation if they refuse to sign, declaring, silence is violence, and if you don't sign now, you will be tarnished as a racist for the rest of your career. I will make sure of it. Eventually, most of the students at AIT signed. Meanwhile, AIT President Craven is interrupted from a busy schedule of meetings on inclusive pronoun usage, equitable landscaping, and bathroom diversity to deal with the latest campus controversy. President Craven is, is presented with a serious conundrum. Should he defend the fundamental purpose of AIT, which is the unfettered produce, pursuit of truth, and risk being called a scary name by Mr. Woke, or should he panic and do whatever it takes to make his anxiety go away quickly so that he can return to attending his important meetings and enjoying his outrageous salary in peace? For Dr. Craven, the choice is easy. He fires Dr. Centrist and returns to his pronoun in landscaping meetings. An unfortunate result of his decision is that we never get the cure for cancer that Dr. Centrist was close to discovering. Will another university or another laboratory hire such a disgraced individual? But this was not high on President Craven's list of priorities. Afterwards, Mr. Woke insists that Dr. Centrist was not canceled. Instead, he was held accountable for his hateful, bigoted, and generally problematic views. Mr. Work is actually fine with the result that we don't get the cure for cancer because he, they, believes that cancer is a social construct caused by systemic racism and that Dr. Centrist's racist scientific method is useless compared to the medicinal benefits of other ways of knowing. But what does the public who funded Dr. Centrist's research and pays for most of the tuition at AIT through federal grants think about losing out on progress toward a cure for cancer because of someone's disapproval of Dr. Centrist's political views, which many people also hold? What would it have taken to avoid this disaster at AIT? As annoying as Mr. Woke is, I think the real villain of the story is President Craven. In order to prevent this terrible outcome that we have just Observed, President Craven doesn't exactly have to turn into Churchill. He just turn, needs to turn into president, not a complete dingleberry. He just needs a tiny bit of spine. All he has to say is, sorry, Mr. Wolf, that's not how we do things around here. You're free to express your opinions. Dr. Centrist is free to express his opinions. You don't get to silence people you disagree with at AIT. This idea is described in the Chicago Principles as follows. It is not the proper, proper role of the university to attempt to shield individuals from ideas and opinions they find unwelcome, disagreeable, or even deeply offensive. Concerns about civility and mutual respect can never be used as a justification for closing off discussion of ideas, however offensive or disagreeable those ideas may be to some members of the community. It is important to get the Chicago principles adopted on your own campus before a crisis occurs. Even President Craven might have been brave enough to stand up to Mr. Woke if he had an official policy that he could point to as an excuse. A standard part of the orientation for new students and faculty should be to explain the moral and intellectual foundations of these principles and more generally of intellectual freedom, both why they are important and how they're going to be enforced. There have to be real penalties for violations. This would help Mr. Woke understand that illiberal tactics will not work, and therefore he won't try them. I also want to emphasize that everyone should have the right to speak on campus. We need to defend everyone. So I'm going to give you an example. I have a colleague who has tiled images of Karl Marx on, on his website. So the whole back of his website is pictures of Marx, and he has a Soviet flag in his office. He's actively introducing a Marxist communist views into campus. I find this offensive, and I think anyone who's taken 10 minutes to study the history of the 20th century, uh, let alone the people who actually suffered under communism, like my wife's family, would also find it offensive. But the fact that my colleague openly advocates for something that I consider 
an indefensible political position has absolutely no bearing on his scientific and mathematical ability. No matter how extreme, immoral, and offensive his or anyone else's political views may be, we need to defend his right to express them freely without letting them hinder his scientific career. Throughout history, many famous scientists have, ha have been highly eccentric and held weird and even repulsive social and political views. So what? Should we therefore renounce the fundamental and critical science that they produced? I don't think so. Okay, second story. Now a story in the Swiss Alps. Professor Wright and Professor Left are attending the Global Economic Forum. They have been appearing at the forum for decades and they agree on almost nothing. Whenever an economic issue arises, Professor Wright argues for less government and Professor Left argues for more government. But they listen to each other's lectures seriously and they respond to each other's arguments. Sometimes Professor Left gets excited and makes a hasty comment about Professor Wright's lecture implying that she is stupid, but he never calls her evil. Even though Professor Wright disagrees with Professor Left, she modifies her perspective when Professor Left shows data that contradicts a claim she is making. In the end, after some back and forth, they tend to reach some sort of conclusion about the matter in question that both can agree is empirically justified. They certainly do not like each other, but each understands that the other is necessary for the critical examination of his or her own views and can lead him or her to better economic research. Now enter a new graduate student. Let us call her Ms. Oppressed. Ms. Oppressed doesn't think that Professor Wright is merely wrong. She believes that she is morally corrupt. How else could someone argue for small government when big government is clearly what is needed to fix the obvious systemic problems in our society that are oppressing women and marginalized people. Ms. Oppress starts a Twitter campaign to force the Global Economic Forum to issue an official statement acknowledging that increasing the size of government is the only solution to all social and economic problems, as well as add a condition that in order to present a paper at the forum, every participant must sign a pledge of agreement with this statement. Professor Left find himself, finds himself in a bind. On the one hand, Ms. Oppress seems to agree with him on most policy issues. And he has never been terribly fond of that bad old Professor Wright. On the other hand, banning speakers rather than contending with their arguments seems to go against the liberal tradition in which Professor Left usually locates himself. While he is considering this issue, Ms. Oppress tells Professor Left that silence is violence and he had better get on board with the program or she will turn to Twitter. Professor Left decides that the best course of action is to declare no enemies on the left and go along with Ms. Oppress. The statement and the pledge are instituted. Professor Wright refuses to sign, and she is henceforth banned, henceforth banned from the Global Economic Forum. Professor Left finds the next forum meeting quite exhilarating. He can expound all his wildest ideas without annoying Professor Wright demanding evidence or logic. Yet he starts to get an uneasy feeling when he attends Ms. Oppress lecture, which is titled Data, Research or Oppression. In it, Ms. Oppressed argues that the data and the ideal of disinterested methodological rigor should no longer be used in economic research because this idea of intellectual debate and rigor as the pinnacle of intellectualism comes from a world in which white men dominated. These deathless, deathless words were actually uttered in October 2021 by Phoebe Cohen, the chair of geosciences at Williams College. In fact, at the end of her lecture, Ms. Oppressed attacks Professor Left because he refused to ban Professor Wright for so many years. Silence is violence after all, and by allowing that sort of hate think at the Global Economic Forum, Professor Left has actively participated in a horrible system of oppression. After the forum, Ms. Ms. Oppressed organizes a letter to have Professor Left and anyone else over the age of 35 banned from all future forums for past collaboration with evil right-wingers, which in addition to being Essential for social justice will have the added benefit of opening lots of career opportunities for Ms. Oppressed and her allies. It works, and Professor Left soon finds himself banned from the most important meeting in the field, suffering the same fate that was visited upon Professor Wright only a year before. Meanwhile, at the next meeting of the Global Economic Forum, all presentations have titles like Indigenous Ways of Managing Global Economies, Feminist Perspectives on Inflation, and Intersectional Debt Management. No one dares to present data or make a rational argument for fear of being labeled a white supremacist. Needless to say, the discussions of economics at the event quickly lose their previous influence upon business leaders and policymakers, 
whose job it is to make actual decisions in the actual world, but it becomes very popular with journalists at the prestigious Journal of Record, the New York Spaces, who write favorable pieces about the exciting new developments in a field that they used to treat with a mixture of confusion and disgust. It is not long before Ms. Press is rewarded for speaking truth to power with a Fitzarthur Genius Award. Okay, the key error here is that Professor Left compromised on the principle that universities and society should never take positions on social political issues. He did this because he tended to agree with the political positions that were being proposed. Doing so makes universities and societies into political entities rather than scientific ones and has the effect of restricting free expression by members of the university community who disagree with the official position. It is particularly important right now that professors on the left do not fall for this trap. Aside from the principal reason for this, there's also a practical reason. They will never be revolutionary enough, and the revolution is sure to eat them next if they fail to stop it now. In the words of the Calvin Report, the instrument of dissent and criticism is the individual faculty member or the individual student. The university is the home and sponsor of critics. It is not itself the critic. To perform its mission in the society, a university must maintain an extraordinary environment of freedom of inquiry and maintain an independence from political fashions, passions, and pressures. A university, if it is, if it is to be true to its faith in intellectual inquiry, must embrace, be hospitable to, and encourage the widest diversity of views within its community. It is a community but only for the limited, albeit great, purposes of teaching and research. It's not a club, it's not a trade association, it's not a lobby. Since the university is a community only for these limited and distinctive purposes, it is a community which cannot take collective action on the issues of the day without endangering the conditions for its existence and effectiveness. There is no mechanism by which it can reach a collective position without inhibiting the full freedom of dissent on which it thrives. It cannot insist that all members favor a given view on social policy. If it takes collective action, therefore, it does so at the price of censoring any censuring any minority who do not agree with the view adopted. In brief, is it, a, it is a community which cannot resort to majority vote to reach positions on political issues. The principle of political neutrality is extremely important for universities though it is often neglected relative to the principle of free expression. So for example, at, at UT Austin, we recently adopted the Chicago principles, but not the Calvin Report. But you cannot have the latter without the former. Free expression is not possible in practice at universities that release statements on social and political issues. Consider 2020 as an example of how this is not supposed to work. Universities and societies across the country issued statements on social and political issues and faculty members who disagreed with them publicly were attacked, silenced, and sometimes even fired. The attackers felt justified by the official statements. Last story. Finally, there is a situation developing in the job search at the physics department at Winthrop University. Winthrop has an aggressive DEI program that has been in place for more than a decade and has already hired dozens of DEI deans and deanlets to implement and promote it. Yet Winthrop physical science dean, Shifty, has recently received word from the president of the Henry Foundation that the foundation is not happy with the numbers that Winthrop's DEI program has produced. In particular, the foundation is expressing concern with the slow progress at appointing an appropriate number of underrepresented faculty in the physical sciences. Given the Henry Foundation's deep pockets and cultural influence, Dean Shifty can see her dreams of a nice presidency at a liberal arts college with a fat paycheck slipping away and takes immediate action Although the, although the advertisement for the physics faculty search explicitly says that there will be no discrimination on the basis of race or sex, Dean Shifty slyly informs the chair of the physics department and the members of the search committee that she will not consider a nomination for the faculty position if it is an Asian or a white man. She does this orally and through an intermediary because she knows that it's a violation of Title VI and IX of the Civil Rights Act. The members of the faculty search committee are uncomfortable, but they feel that they have no choice but to comply. They do not actually know what is in the Civil Rights Act, they're physicists, not lawyers, but they assume that Dean Shifty would not do anything illegal. False. A fierce debate soon emerges 
on the hiring committee. It turns out that half the committee thinks the department needs a woman, and half the committee thinks the department needs an underrepresented minority. Instead of debating the scientific merits of the candidates, the committee spends its time debating which type of underrepresented person should be recruited. In the end, they settle on hiring a woman because there are more women than underrepresented minorities among the graduate students, and the students need a few more faculty members who look like them. They hire a woman, and both Dean Shifty and the president of the Henry Foundation are thrilled. Of course, the entirety of the faculty are vaguely aware of what happened, which leads to a strange and uncomfortable situation for the new member of the department. Meanwhile, similar hiring shenanigans have been implemented at universities across the country, so male, Asian, and white candidates find it extremely difficult to get faculty jobs, and many end up leaving the field. Notice what happened when hiring criteria other than scientific merit were introduced. It immediately made the process political. Whether to hire a woman or an underrepresented minority is a political question, not a scientific question. In order to avoid the politicization of science, therefore, it is absolutely essential that all admissions, hiring, promotion, and honors be awarded on the basis of scientific merit alone. Politics is automatically introduced when purely merit-based decisions are abandoned. Moreover, ideological purity tests, such as DI statements, are now often used as a gatekeeping mechanism to ensure political uniformity in faculty hiring. And this quite obviously violates the principle of political also, note that the purpose of the university and of science is being violated if criteria other than merit are used for hiring. In such cases, we are no longer pursuing the truth to the best of our ability. We have instead substituted some other goal. These matters were discussed in the Shills report as follows. The conception of the proper tasks of the university determines the criteria which should govern the appointment retention and promotion of members of the academic staff. The criteria which are to be applied in the case of appointments to the University of Chicago should therefore be criteria which give preference above all to actual and prospective scholarly and scientific accomplishment of the highest order, actual and prospective teaching accomplishment of the highest order, and actual and prospective contribution to the intellectual quality of the university through critical stimulation of others within the university to produce work of the highest quality. Note that the last clause refers strictly to stimulating others to produce work of the highest quality and should not be interpreted as a way to sneak other criteria into consideration. And later, there must be no consideration of sex, ethnic, or national char characteristics, political or, or religious beliefs or affiliations, or anything else in, the determ in any determination regarding appointment, promotion, or reappointment at any level of the academic uh, staff. The objective of this rule is simple. Fairness. The principles of academic freedom confer not only a right, but also a duty. Some people think that the duty of academic freedom is to restrict your speech in certain cases, but this is incorrect. The duty of academic freedom is to actually use it. My obligation is, as a professor and a scientist is to say what I really think in public, while of course focusing my teaching on the particular subject I was hired to teach, not least because so many people in society cannot. The whole point of the professional protection known as tenure is to actually speak up. Too often, tenure is wasted on the timid. And anyways, they can't cancel all of us. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's delicate. It's a delicate, issue. It's a delicate issue. The way I would put it is this. It, it, I think it's reasonable to have as a condition for employment accepting these, these reports. Uh, and then for external, as in terms of university functioning, and in terms in terms of uh, external extramural speech, I think the faculty should be allowed to speak as they want. But that's not external extramural speech if you have that in your. Well, he's not okay, but he's not saying or site in your. This guy's a statistician. He's not I know, saying. I know who he's exactly what you're talking about. He's yeah. not saying in his stats class. Okay, so so that so that so it so counts as actual real speech. But, but you, you know that even if he says he accepts the three reports, that you know, another part of that philosophy is why it's that political power. So you know, if you have identified someone who will always vote in favor of excluding other perspectives, how do you let how do you how do you let them know about it? So Lauren, what do you think? How do they kind of like that? Well, I mean, there are different flavors of communists. Right. No, 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 we will ruin communism for for that. It's, it's almost the definition of it. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, it kind of gets to this point, but I wanted to ask you about the, the point about you no know, kind of collective political yeah, yeah. statements in university. That's the one where I'm kind of like, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because so, um, like, well, first of all, there's more kind of parochial universities that are like Christian universities, but Christianity is good and it's not bad. It's a kind of Social statement, right? Uh, and I'm thinking, and Richard mentioned that the flag, like right? you know, saying the Star Spangled Banner is like a political statement of America is good. That is a yeah. kind of, and like flying the American flag is saying some kind of political statement about America it is not bad, at least, right? It's good, it's not bad. So, yeah, um, so well, so yeah, okay, so let's take that example. Example. So I would be uncomfortable if the president of the University of Chicago made a statement saying, uh, I expect all University of Chicago students and faculty to be patriotic Americans. But flying the flag in the middle of the quad. I think that's a Well, I think that's just your movie in the United Yeah, that's just a statement of that. that <laughs> that we're living under the jurisdiction of the United States of America. But I think it's different. So, I mean, there was a, uh, a history of this in the 1950s uh, of faculty having to sign statements that they were opposed to communism. Yeah, no, Richard's going to get into this. Richard thinks, <laughs> Richard, Richard, no, no, Richard no. thinks that if, if we had just instituted those anti communist statements, we wouldn't be the best for it. I have no commitment to conflict, my responsibility is to respect the impartial scholarship. That seems like something that you should be required to adhere to as a faculty member, and it should be enforceable if you get evidence that you have such conflict. Sorry. What was that you just read? That was the loyalty. Yeah. Yeah. That's what everyone's so upset about. Oh, can you read it again? Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, I can't read it. Yeah, so the, the part is I have no commitment to the conflict in my responsibility to respect impartial scholarship and free to choose the That's what we need. We don't need we're better. Better. We need brutality. We need brutality. Yeah. So, so if, yeah. if you find out someone is an you know, if you find out that someone has a philosophy of choice politics and always vote against people based on their politics, they need to be fired. Yeah. So for example, here's an example, I believe an example of that. Um, Wednesday, November 9, 2016, there were a number of classes in this campus, in this campus canceled. Or you know, struggle sessions that took place. Because, well, today is our God's day in America. Oh, that was that. That was actually Donald Trump. But that Wednesday, Wednesday morning, lots of classes were canceled. Yeah. Like people were just like, you know, just like it's an opportunity for us to talk about whether the class is physics or mathematics. Yeah. And I think to me, it's a violation of your responsibility. Oh, yeah, no, I agree. And, and, but there's no punishment for it. Right. There's no punishment for that. fired because that's someone who's not fired. Not fired. <laughs> <laughs> I think How is this not self uh, contradicting? I don't understand. So if, if if I don't 
you have put that up, and you uh, are signed that pledge, and then you would uh, categorically prohibit anybody with a social sign on their wall from no, no, the communist flag. Whatever it is. Then whatever I understand the difference. Whatever worldview it is that you don't like, and I would be great about this, of course. But that seems like it would be you violating the pledge that you just read. No, because it's not interfering with the impartial search for truth. I was inspired because they are interfering with the impartial search for truth. So you would disallow that person to become a faculty member because you believe their presence will interfere because they have a conflict of interest that interferes with the impartial search for truth. I do not think someone should be at a university if they're the sort of person who is going to vote on politics and not um, merit in committee. committees. And you know, you like there's tons of things that I think are stupid ideas that I would include there, but that specific thing, you cannot have an institution that has people committed to the suppression of ideas and expect expect. But being anti-communist specifically is not a political view. Uh, thank you. It may be a political viewpoint, but it's one that you have to adhere to. If it's, it's a political viewpoint, then it seems like it's a self-contradictory pledge. It's not no, because it's not it doesn't interfere with the view of truth. Anti-communism is, you know, the element of anti-communism that you need is, no, I don't agree that politics should trump the search for truth. Okay, so then, just, I just wanted to flesh this out. So then, you have a communist who says, I adhere to communism, except for that part about trumping. Well, the problem there is, as soon as, you're, as, soon as you have someone who is, like, if you can identify someone who is a communist. It has to be about acting. It has to be about acting. That's the problem. Like, you cannot just think by, oh, I cannot trust their ability to vote. No, I totally believe. Oh, the act of being that this is the communist yeah, class. Asserting that <laughs> I am a communist <laughs> is a statement that I will always vote against conservatives in committees. Or not conservatives, they're just like oh, okay. counter revolutionaries. So you have to, you know, it may not be possible. Yeah. If you want to have that, but if you want to have no kind of government, then you can. So let's take a step first. Let's take a step first. Forget about the communist flag. Because communists, we have plenty here in Scandinavia. What if it's a swastika? Mm -hmm. No, I guess I mean, you agree. No, I'm, 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 I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you, right? What is this one? So th this came up. So there's the guy who has the communist flag. He doesn't get bothered. Another colleague who had the uh, I forget what it's called. Not a swastika. No. <laughs> okay. okay. The libertarian flag. No. So there is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he had that. This he uh, he got the. You wait, 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 wait. That, that, I didn't finish. finish. And the Gadsden flag people are part of a thick set that allow the. Well, the so, but the issue was he got, um, you know, hauled in front of, it through the whole uh, uh, harassment administry, administrator uh, because. Because of the flag. Students reported him, they said they felt uncomfortable being in the office of someone who had that flag because people who like gun rights have the flag and they didn't feel safe. Uh, yeah, exactly. that, that the yeah, well, so then what happened was, so what happened was you have all these administrators who think that it's their job to make sure students feel safe, and they don't, and that is their job, but they don't have also as their job the pursuit of truth, so that's not part, that's not like pulling on them at all. So they would just start harassing him and, you know, summoning him to meetings and stuff, but this guy is a very ordinary guy, and he just, so, he refused, he got a lawyer, refused to come to any meetings with them and sent them a bunch of threatening emails and they backed off. It's part of the problem that people who aren't, uh, who, who like the guys who fly but not the communist one, that they don't report this stuff and sort of use the process against yourself. Is that, is that a solution? Or just not enough for them? Right? I mean, yeah. It's asymmetric. So correct, if, correct. If, if you tolerate the people who want to silence everyone else and the people who don't want to silence everyone else and don't fight back against the silencers, you're going to end up with an institution that is completely dominated. Did you think, think, in one direction. think through the, the, the dynamics of this. Like you, you have 40% crazy leftists, 55% you know, cowardly centrists. You know, that, you're, you're never going to grow the fresh set of people who have sensible ideas. Like once the personnel goes like this, you can write all the Chicago reports you want, and it's not going to be a damn bit of difference as long as there's some sort of faculty government. Well, the children, so I mean, no, the children were one doing the picture. 
the shelter work at least will focus people on merit based hiring, but it's true. But if, if 60% of people don't want merit based hiring, 35% don't want to say anything. So, 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 let me suggest this on the, on the basis of something that's about to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or at least it's something that's hoping. It's good to consider you know, specific examples. It's, yeah, and the specific example is a Supreme Court decision that most likely will come down against affirmative action. The decision hopefully is going to be something like no race or gender or any immutable characteristics shall be used by a university to make an admission decision. Right? Yeah. That hopefully reads that way. Let's assume it reads that way. If it reads that way, what do you think the current apparatus of admissions will do across the country? They're just going to be like, oh, okay, we'll follow the law. Well, okay, so I agree. Or, yeah. or they will do everything in their power. To continue to do their quote holistic admission yeah. without so, violating them okay. or, or without without overtly them. Let me tell you what I uh, hope for. So the, one issue is that the administrators who do admissions they don't want to stop doing the stuff they're doing because then they don't. Don't blame the administrators. The faculty are a hundred percent in agreement. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. Okay. Um, what I hope is going to happen is that there's going to be some sort of economic affirmative action. And that will also correlate with racial affirmative action. And so hopefully everybody will be happy about it. Our solution is to use videos for admission. I don't think that's pretty economic affirmative action. They're going to switch to having video interviews so that you can tell the race of the students. So I think that was just directly the response to the question of what are we going to yeah. do when they ban affirmative action. But I think that, you know, I think there's an argument, I think you can make a, a, a good moral argument for economic. Yeah, but that's not a jury. No, that's against, it goes against your merit system. It goes against the merit system. I know, but, you know, it's a compromise. Oh, okay, so, so now we're just being, okay, you, you, you're thinking about a, a compromise. I'm thinking about it. what I'm thinking the best possible. Okay, so, so, so you're not hoping, like, as you are hoping that's a good outcome. It's just like the I'm best possible saying, outcome. That, that's what I hope that it gets settled on. Uh, what's probably more likely is that they'll do things. They'll do things like zip codes. Uh, I, I mean, I don't think it's because well, well, yeah. they've already said that. Yeah. Like, yeah. California has. Yeah, that's exactly. Exactly. And yet they still the that's right. the ratio. The, the quota that they're looking for. So, so that, that's I think the, the, the richest point. The statement they can be very backy in the sense that we have a state with authority, with a constitutional authority that says you shall not do this. And the institutions do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, I mean, that's going on a lot. Uh, so somebody has to take control of this. That is not the faculty, that is not the government administration. I don't know. I mean, in California, the only hope in California would be the politicians of California. They are, you know, doing the work of the people that said, you shall not do this through a constitutional amendment, right? They have that in the, in, in the most sacred of ways in which we think about rule of law and democratic government. And yet, the people in charge disregard that, right? So in there, in California, you don't hope Gavin Deuce is gonna come in and say, hey, border governors of the University of California, we're gonna do something about it. No, they're gonna do it. So you know that. But in Texas, you would hope that, you know, maybe the politicians would do something about it. Now, now at the University of Chicago, I, I think you expect probably better behavior. But like at Williams College, who's gonna keep, you know, Williams College? Yeah. I mean, maybe there'll be a lawsuit at some point, maybe there'll be, I guess they only hope. I mean, so there's a huge asymmetry in productivity and basically who cares what Williams College does. And, and for Microsoft. Oh, I, again, I don't agree with you, but we can go back to Harvard. That's a bigger issue. Yeah, that's a bigger issue. I feel like there's there's a couple of parts to it. There's penalties and then there's the enforcement of it and who's doing the enforcement. And can you count on those people to actually do their jobs? We have, there's plenty of laws on the books right now, for example, about the border crisis. That they simply just do not enforce on the federal level, which then puts a lot of that shit onto the states to follow through. And being in a system that pushes states' rights over federal rights, it's going to be very incumbent upon individual states to actually then act upon the law for them. And what actually makes them do that then? But I think going back to the, the, the I, I agree, and, and going back to the, the principles, the three principles, right? Yeah. I think that what they all they lack. All of them is a mechanism, some sort of balance, explicit balance for it. So I think that would change the behavior. principles does have explicit penalties. Did that? Okay, so uh, what, they have, there's a second report that lays out. That's not part of what. Okay, okay, so what, what is the, so what are the penalties and how they are supposed yeah, to Yeah, well, the problem is they're not strong enough, but it's things like you, you can get expelled if you disrupt the 
uh, class at UC Chicago, a student community as well. Okay. Uh, but it, it's like the way our, I don't know, internal justice system works, that's a really unlikely possibility. But you know, you, you've got to say somebody reads that and probably are yeah. afraid, right? And we have to go out of the way. No, I'm sure there's a lot of students that will be afraid. Yeah. But we don't have, we, it's not a serious issue at UC Chicago. Like, you know, I don't know. We could invite Richard in, and he could give his communist, anti-communist talk, and I don't think it would be disruptive. I think we invite Richard, and he would give a talk on uh, Reeves directing McCarthy, or something about that. Uh, uh, something uh, like that. Uh, Defend, on the defense of McCarthy. Yeah, so that's like they're totally unenforced. Yes, so the that's not totally true. So at U Chicago, the Shills report is preventing us from requiring DEI statements. Okay. And so it is doing something. Uh, okay. Well, tell us about the process of that. Why is it? Who is making sure that they're, they're the provost right? office? So every so the provost and the president have to approve every faculty hiring case. Okay. And. Uh, and they they have these like when there's a search committee they give instructions on what you can include in the case like you can't ask for someone's birth date you can't ask for what movie team they played on and these instructions explicitly say it would be a violation of the shield report if you ask for a di statement if, if you send us a package where you ask for a di statement we where you have to do review the search <laughs> like diversity equity inclusion yeah, so what is the, maybe it's just sort of a, an accident of history, but you said that UC Austin has adopted Chicago without the rest, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the Board of Regents. Yeah. What is the, so it, when you have a system of rules that setting aside the fact that it's GTOC perhaps, but that they depend on each other, you said in your essay that sort of one doesn't work without the other. Yeah. Why have them as separate things that can be cherry picked and I'll adopt this one but not that one? Why not have yeah, like anything one yeah, time? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that, that would be great. So, the yeah, we, sure, yeah. Yeah, so they just, it's hit for, I mean, these principles started off as it, it's kind of like more in the British way of just that was how we do things and everyone knows how we do things. And then at various times, people felt like they had to write them down. And they wrote them down at times when there were people arguing against them. And so that's just a historical accident. But I agree that if someone were founding a new university, <laughs> a constitution, they might want to have to start referring to them collectively instead of individually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's one of, the, one, of the, one of the concerns I have is exactly people, people conflate those things they don't, they don't understand. It. They didn't do the work of reading them carefully and actually the history. So people talk about, oh, the Chicago principles. Literally, the border regions of the state of Texas, right, through a chief doc statement, just went and said, we adopt the Chicago principles. That's it, quote, the Chicago principles for our, our institutions. They don't say exactly what that means. What I mean, the Chicago principles are free expression, the, you know, all those things. Why the Chicago principles? Do you have like, in, now this, and it's chief doc in a sense that that commitment to free expression is already by court, by court decision, uh, uh, embedded in a public institution. So we, as professors at the University of Texas, have that protection anyway, as students as well. So it, it's like, you know, that was absolutely cheap, right? And the other two would be actually very important if they were to be played. But then I don't even know about it. I guarantee you that our chairman of the Board of Regents does not know that it exists a thing called the Calvin Report. Or and the Shield Report. It's, it's an important point to make that the, the Chicago principles are necessary at a private institute because we don't have the first, we're not bound by the First Amendment. But you guys are bound by the First Amendment anyway. Right? There was a question yeah. of that. Yes, thanks. I think so. Uh, I went back to the law school and uh, we kind of just you know, talk about this kind of stuff too, kind of ironic. But um, I, I had a question about the different scenario in, in law school. I don't know if people here are familiar with our journals and law reviews are uh, decisions are made by the law students. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, it's kind of different in other disciplines and journals and stuff. Yeah. Like that. So I was wondering if you could applying of things you mentioned to that kind of scenario, it's just a different publication world, because uh, a lot of the decisions by law students are made based on you know, kind of their, their beliefs, right, their actual beliefs, and so would you be able to apply anything, anything to uh, changing the law review submission in the law school? Uh, 
uh, in one of all kinds of talk about this too. But there was an issue about a year ago. I don't remember. It was like a, a law professor. Basically, they told the the students told them he had to revise certain things in order to go through review, and then a bunch of other. It was it was basically like some memorial for for some older professor, and then a bunch of the, and he refused, and then a bunch of the other law professors, you know, pulled their paper. You know what I'm talking about? I don't, there's a few famous seniors in the last couple of years that are kind of USC, and there's same in various kinds of schools, but I don't know if that would be. Yeah, I think it might have been San Diego. But anyway, yeah. it seems like uh, for academic publishing in general, the only consideration should be the merit of, of the article, and that should apply for law journals, don't you think? Uh, like ideally, that would be the situation. I don't think it is. Yeah, because because it's differently than our. We have problems with our society that run our journals. Yeah, be potentially some field politicized and getting captured. Super politicized. No, no, it's happening in our system, right? With a peer review system. But there is not even peer review. There's no even pretense of peer review. Is there a peer review? Or no, it's no. students. Some like compared to law journals are, are not, but generally it's student Yeah. So I mean, what's the most prestigious place to publish in a law professor? Harvard Law Review. Yeah, and that's that's run by students, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, the whole system is a little wonky. Like, if you read the old, sometimes I I have to look up an old paper from like. The Royal Society from 100 years ago. And the way it worked there was like all of us would meet like this, and we would all come to the monthly meeting with our latest research. And, you know, like not everyone, maybe five of us would have a research and we read the research, and then they would record everyone's criticism, and that was the review. And then you would get a chance to revise it, and you read the paper and the criticism and what was revised. And something like that seems like a better model, where all of the reviews are public, and and where you don't reject papers, where you just publish it with the rejection reviews. Something like that. Uh, but but the problem is, you know, they use these like some of these journals are supposedly like in my field, it's like Nature. You know, supposedly you read a paper in Nature, it's supposed to be like really awesome and uh, whatever. And so the problem is, if they have to publish everything that gets submitted to them, they they lose that that thing that they're monetizing. And I do think also that we make the big distinction between focusing on your essay and the discussion on the science. Yeah, because it's a lot more objective. Right. Uh, you know, people can try whatever way they want to try to talk about the different ways of knowing and the yeah. discussion of sculpture. This is that. No, there don't is, worry, they do. Yeah, I know, I know. But but in some ways, that's a much easier fight to be had. Than the yeah. fight that you know encompasses social systems, yeah. right? uh, where where if you're talking about somebody studying political science, it's going to be very hard to have those principles applied in a coherent way in a way that that does you know. yeah. So I I, I I have a lot of hopes for what those 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 reports can accomplish, but I just think it it without some external force of exerting control of the university and, yeah. and, and against politicization. Yeah. So, so the, uh, one way to tie these two comments together, Tom Ginsberg at the UChicago Law has been designing training programs on academic freedom uh, orientation for students coming in. And so part of these programs is really explicit scenarios where the student is put in the position of the administrator. And they have to see the trade-offs and why it's important to let everybody uh, speak openly. And so things like that could at least help encourage that mindset in the students. Uh, and then the other thing that Ginsburg has advocated in, in op-eds is uh, academic freedom administrators. Uh, everyone hates administrators, but at least if someone at the table with the dean or the president, their entire uh, position is to advocate for academic freedom, then when things when things get pulled in one direction, you have somebody sitting there who takes it back. One of my colleagues said, uh, that's like having someone at the synagogue whose job is to defend Torah. <laughs> but, it, but it may be necessary at this point. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, how would the discussion involve? Um, you know, what, what, what would you say? Uh, 
Yeah, exactly. So that's that. So, uh, right. So the these principles of neutrality are for secular universities, and I think it's totally appropriate for a Christian university to say this is our creedal statement. Uh, if you want to come to our university, you have to accept this statement. That's my opinion. But it should be upfront to be saying it on the way in. So what about uh, Well, there are, I don't think there are a lot of Christians left there. <laughs> I probably should have. No, no, no. Really? Yeah. No. no. I'm, I'm, okay, so you can get a master's of divinity. Yeah, I think it's 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 more the study of religion. They're not training ministers there. Uh, but yeah, I would say any any school that's a sub section of a modern secular university. You know, the divinity school, you should allow people to argue from a position of faith, but you should also allow people to argue as a Buddhist or a atheist. That would be my opinion. But do you have what you uh, Another question I think the discussion about uh, it's a new subject is, I guess, in law and law. It seems to be that way. I come from an engineering background, the law. I was wondering about applying to interdisciplinary hires. And yeah. There are different philosophies and different schools. Sometimes they're just joined the point of faculty yeah. hires or cluster hires and so on. Is there anything um, about what you're uh, discussing uh, that would be different or would apply the same to interdisciplinary hires? Yeah, so I don't think it would apply the same. So, I mean, an interdisciplinary hiring process I participated in was extrasolar planet research at U Chicago. And we made a search committee that included geophysics and astrophysics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we had criteria that didn't fit exactly in either department that fit kind of between, but they were all academic criteria. And we interviewed people just like any other position. Maybe it's different in, in humanities or law, but I, I feel like, you know, like suppose you want someone uh, on the, on internet, but would international development law be in the law school, or would it be? Well, like here, you can have several faculty components of law school that have some sort of curriculum. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so every subunit within the university should presumably have, be able to define, to define their academic domain, and you should be able to define an overlap that's relevant for this particular search, and then you can do a merit-based search based on that. It seems, to me, it seems like you could do that. Let me ask a question to you on the because law is a place where I think that there is a, a very big disconnect between how bench judges you know are selected and how they act and how and how we are educated students. So if I'm not wrong, the University of Texas Law School does not have somebody that we can describe as a origin originalist in their teaching. Is that correct? I, I know some of that, but I'm not going to hear it. Um, I think that's true, right? I think Chicago is one of the most kind of schools. Right. And, and, and to some extent, that decision to hire a constitutional scholar that comes from one particular persuasion versus another, it is a political decision anyway. True. Because it's going to be like, there is, okay, here's a philosophy of law that I abide by. That's how I read things and how I write, I think about writing, and therefore I teach my students to read and write in this way, whereas others have a very different position, right? And it, of course, it's and not to it correctly, the, the doesn't reflect that the courts are what the, the universities are the face. But my point is that, well, how do we reconcile those two things? If you let, let's say somebody comes in and says, all right, we want to try to be reflective of both yeah. ways in which both ways of learning <laughs> when it comes to law writing, right? Um, how do we put that yeah, in place without, 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 here, here's without how, so the show report says that academic appointment should be made on the basis of contribution to research and teaching. Uh, you're not educating law students well if, if the dom it's now the dominant uh, theory of interpretation in the federal courts is not being taught to them. So it's simple. You don't have to make a political argument or anything. You just say, we want to teach our students well. The fact that correlates to the political point of view doesn't yeah, matter it's because it's a, it's a... And then the issue, in terms, so some people want like affirmative action for conservatives or something. And, and I think that's a bad yeah. idea. Not a problem that Luke and Luke and not one that. Who does? Greg. Uh, yeah, yeah, he yeah. just mentioned that. But my opinion is, uh, you don't have to do something like that. Just 
get rid of the explicit discrimination. That goes back to Richard's point, but um, if it's actually get rid of the explicit discrimination, yeah. yeah. as long as 90% of people want to discriminate and they don't have a right to be an implicit discrimination, and they can just vote the way they're going to vote, then it'll never accomplish anything. Not everyone puts a colony to swipe in all this situation. How many offers have opened in their heart? Right. How many offers have Roland Fryer received since you know, we were yeah, in favor of Roland Fryer? I mean, I mean, I don't feel, don't feel bad for Roland Fryer. He's doing fine. But he's, he's, he's making way more money than he was. That, that, that's yeah. fine. But, but, you know, how many offers has Roland Fryer received? Uh, it is an issue. Like, I know I suggested it to some econ faculty, and they don't seem to admire it. No, but we, we heard a story in the Stanford. The Stanford conference of a very prominent university that was presented in that conference without so disclosing anything here. Yeah, they yeah, there's an opportunity that's let's, let's go some you know an university at the caliber of Harvard, right? Yeah. Uh, let's do this and then you know couldn't couldn't be had because and there's no excuse. It's like well no it's just no it's a, it's a it's a political and it's not even political in that sense in the sense that that's not a Republican voter. That's a Democratic voter. Who well use the don't abide the don't comply with the you know yeah. I'm guessing that he's a What important part of the role of the prior case is that they didn't try to silence him directly. They used a, they used a harassment, an invented harassment, uh, whatever, in, inquiry. Right. To get but, when you, but when you have people who do things like that, writing new policies is not going to make any difference as long as you do. You're stuck with the idea that the sort of people who do things like that yeah. ought to be protected by our principles. You're never going to. Well, so I, I mean, it's like with the Constitution. It's, you know, I forget whose quote this is, but I'm going to paraphrase a quote. I can't remember who it's from, so it's, it's totally garbled. But the basic idea is you're, you're, you have to assume that people are not angels. You know, you, you have to write your policy. Medicine, right? Yeah. You have to write your policies assuming that people are going to try to exploit them and then somehow figure out a way that the system's going to work. But that only works if you're not in a completely majority of the situation. Right? It's like you need a constitutional yeah. republic. Yeah. 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 If yeah. you will you know, give me a Supreme Court to oversee faculty hiring and let me pick the nine people on it, and then things should be fine. Yeah. Well, but at UChicago, so our Supreme, I mean, we're basically a, at the end of the day, we're a monarchy. And uh, a monarchy with an appointed monarch appointed by a small board of rich businessmen, basically. And that really helps. So uh, people get excited about faculty governance. I think it can be important. But as a member of the Council of the University Senate, I'm pretty glad that the faculty don't have more power. And so we have, we have an adult in the room making sure things don't get too crazy. That's our president. But if we get a bad president, we're screwed. There's just no way around telling me about it. <laughs> yeah. So, how different is it? Um, uh, well, so the biggest difference that we talked about before is public institutions are bound by the Constitution to guarantee First Amendment protections for speech, whereas private institutions, they're not. And so they can adopt a statement like the Chicago Principle saying, we're going to let everyone express themselves freely, but they're not bound by, uh, by that. The other big difference is that publicly funded institutions are much more accountable to the taxpayers. And so, you know, in theory, the, uh, the voters in, the, if, uh, in Texas could say, this is an important issue for us. And then through the legislature and the governor, they would, you know, talk to the president of the university, and there some change could happen. But a private university, that, that lever doesn't exist. The only potential way it exists is that even private universities are mostly funded uh, through federal grants, uh, either through tuition, which a lot of it comes from federal loans, or through directly through grants for research. And so you could put conditions on the federal grants saying we expect from a university, this sort of uh, academic freedom protection. That's a good question. And I think one of the one of the issues that that would note would be observed, right, is that for good reason, when universities, public universities, started, they had a very 
uh, good idea at the time of the Berlin Rent Institution, very much motivated by this, going to provide you with a, a lot of money right now. And when it gives you some defense, when it keeps some arms length, because we know the political process and, and this thing should not be directly attached, right? But then once that thing becomes politicized, now we have a lot of rules in place that keeps a lot of separation between the political system and the university that has been harder for the political system to come in and re-steer things in the right direction because of the provision that was put in place in the very beginning. Uh, so so they will have this fact that they still have well, they thought they were monks. No, they thought that we were monks. Uh, yeah. yeah, they thought that we were monks, and they turns out we're not. So, and and uh, they didn't work out. I mean, work out for a while. Uh, they work out for a while. Yeah. Um, and and now I think, for example, one of the I think we had nice thing to do is uh, we elect executives, a lot of commissioners. Mm -hmm. So railroad commissioners elected, the uh, agriculture commissioners elected. There's a lot of positions that we both directed that manage budgets sometimes, I think, smaller than the collective budget of the state of Texas case for all universities, for example. So it would be, I think, a natural thing to have a commissioner, somebody that's elected, I think, for years, to be like, okay, your job is to oversee the whole thing, and, you know, you're accountable for it now. So, so that could help. In Texas, could help. <laughs> Any questions online? All right. Thanks, Dorian, again.